Hi, this is George Van Heer, and my task is to present this overview of mapping and ablation for this fellows course on the first day of PD Rhythm. It's a big topic, and I'll just be kind of hitting the high points. My dis principal disclosure is that I'm now actually working for the FDA um, as Senior Pediatric Medical Officer in the Office of Cardiovascular Devices in the Center for Devices and Radiologic Health. And the agency would like me to make clear that all ex opinions that I express are personal and do not represent uh, official FDA policy. In terms of mapping, we're going to discuss a number of approaches uh, to mapping uh, that have been used over the years. First of all, uh, standard electrogram based or classic mapping, electroanatomic mapping, uh, substrate voltage mapping, in particular, uh, voltage mapping and AVNRT, entrainment mapping, and then finally, these other concepts like bump mapping, ice mapping, and mapping using automaticity. So uh, I'm kind of old and um, my training and a lot of my clinical experience uh, preceded the availability of electroanatomic mapping. And so uh, younger people in the audience might wonder, whatever did we do before Cardo and Navix was available? Well, what we did was we put a bunch of catheters in the heart and we use those catheters to actually uh, map doing point to point. Um, here's a nice example of a patient with a left-sided concealed accessory pathway. A1A2 shows an equibeat, and you can see the um, earliest retrograde atrial activation occurring here on CS1 and 2, uh, which is uh, distally. Um, and uh, this actually still suffices for the vast majority of cases that, uh, that we do. Um, and it's important to remember that uh, there's lots of things that you can learn from the study that actually help you with your mapping approach. Um, one of our mottos in our laboratory is don't forget to do the study. In other words, um, don't um, focus on the tachycardia and forget to do all the rest of the, uh, of the study. Um, often, um, uh, one strip or even a single bead may be enough to make a diagnosis. Um, and really, it's hard to um, think about doing catheter ablation um, unless you make a diagnosis first. So you can do all the mapping in the world that you want, but if you don't have a firm diagnosis, um, you shouldn't be doing an ablation. Um, here's an example of a patient who um, transitions from a uh, uh, left bundle branch uh, aberration uh, to uh, normal um, QRS in the middle of an episode of tachycardia, and one can see that the VA time measured here to CS distal is 120 milliseconds during the left bundle branch block sustained aberration. And then when that expires and we have a normal QRS, that VA time shortens to 58 uh, milliseconds. Um, so our other model in the laboratory is care enough to measure. Um, that 58 milliseconds is about as short as any VA time gets in AVRT. And so we can be pretty confident that CS12 is the site of the pathway. The shortening of VA time with loss of the left bundle, of course, uh, means that we're dealing with a left free all pathway. And you know that before you even um, uh, do any mapping whatsoever. Um, also, careful assessment of electrograms is um, part of the deal. Um, uh, I think uh, if one recognizes uh, this as um, particular pacing with retrograde conduction up an accessory pathway, um, on the ablation catheter, we have a very, very appetizing uh, signal here. Uh, a, a nice V, a nice A of about equal size, and um, a tiny little uh, electrogram in the middle, of which might or might not be an accessory pathway potential. Um, a lot of times, um, it isn't so much the mapping, although that's important, um, but it's also the, um, uh, the critical assessment of the electrograms that guides us in terms of what our, our, our target um, should be. So electroanatomic mapping has been with us since about 1998, um, when um, Carter was, uh, uh, first came online. Um, and I think most people sort of understand this now. It's a computer 3D display of the geometry. Um, we are able to display the information as an isochronal map, which basically show, shows uh, a map with uh, zones of color corresponding to a particular timing. One can also do a voltage map um, on the geometry, um, or one can actually animate a propagation map to sort of show you how electricity is moving through the heart. And, and this is very powerful. Um, Add-ons include um, including echocardiography, um, uh, superimposing a fluoro image, 
or registering a CT or an MRI three-dimensional image to improve the, uh, the three-dimensional representation of what's uh, going on. This particular um, map is actually an isochronal map that shows earliest activation of an ectopic atrial tachycardia with um, uh, uh, the uh, spots of, um, of ablation uh, uh, superimposed over that site. So there are certainly lots of advantages to electrotomic mapping, uh, but there are some cautions that um, I just want to make sure people are really understand. Um, first of all, for me, the most uh, important advantage of electroanatomic mapping is being able to get back to a particular site. Uh, this comes up all the time. Um, when you have a successful site, you want to mark it. If the pathway then recurs, you want to be able to get back to that spot easily and, and quickly. Um, obviously, uh, using electroanatomic mapping allows you to reduce or maybe even eliminate fluoroscopy. That's a whole other discussion. Um, you can also see the entire circuit if you actually map the entire heart. Um, and then finally, you can bill for 3D mapping, except um, in the U.S. at least, um, just recently uh, CMS uh, changed the coding and now 3D mapping is basically bundled with our standard ablation, so it doesn't help. Um, there are some disadvantages and some cautions that, I've, that it's, easy to re it's easy to forget. So first of all, um, not all reentrant arrhythmias are mapped based on earliest activation. Probably the best example of this is um, high pathway tachycardia, um, in which uh, we don't really care um, so much what the earliest ventricular activation is because it's well off the AV groove and distant from where the Mahim pathway is. Um, so it doesn't really help us with that. Um, uh, AV node reentry, another example of you know uh, earliest activation during AV node reentry, classically AV node reentry is going to be at the fast pathway, and that's not our target. Um, more importantly, and maybe a little bit subtle, is that. The, the computer program actually interpolates between the points that you acquire. Um, and, and for that reason, if you don't acquire that many points, there are uh, essentially the, the machine is, is blending uh, the timing between the points, and that can be somewhat misleading. Um, double potentials are off, often um, create a problem um, because the way um, the electroanatomic mapping systems work um, is you have to. Um, I, you have to choose the timing at the particular location. By definition, if you're dealing with a double potential, which means uh, conduction um, around a fixed uh, line of block, um, you have two waves of activation, one going up one side of the line of block and then coming down the other side, and you have to choose. Um, and Carter doesn't, doesn't do well with that. Um, so uh, the other thing is it's easy to waste your time mapping parts of the heart that have nothing to do with the basic diagnosis. Um, and I'll show a slide of that in a moment. Um, and then finally, um, you know, just mapping doesn't mean that you've made a diagnosis. Sometimes it indicates that what the diagnosis is, but often um, uh, it's really not enough. You have to do maneuvers to make a firm diagnosis um, before you go. Um, so, you know, the limitation of, making a di of using Carter to make a diagnosis is that um, isochronal maps may not clearly differentiate macro reentry, micro reentry, and automatic focus tachycardia. Um, the reason for this is that um, if you have a, say, micro reentry or, fo or a focus, um, the way it conducts through the rest of the atrium, depending on the patient's history, uh, the conduction may actually be constrained by lines of block, just like they would be with their, with um, uh, atrial flutter, um, a macro reentry and atrial flutter. And in fact, they, they may even occupy the entire um, you know, tachycardia interval, and so it can appear to be a reentry when it really isn't. Um, and then conduction into bystander zones uh, uh, can appear to be from a single site and can appear, appear focal. I'll show you an example of that here. This is a patient with a mustard. And um, this is the, on um, the left side here is the systemic, I'm sorry, the, the pulmonary venous atrium with um, a nice uh, isochronal map showing orbiting around the tricuspid valve, which is pretty straightforward. Um, but in this patient, not a mustard, but a setting, um, this is a systemic venous atrium and it really looks focal. Um, it looks focal because the tachycardia is coming from the other side of the baffle and it's just breaking through at this location. Um, so as I said before, first step is to make a diagnosis um, and don't waste your time mapping uh, parts of the heart that aren't, aren't part of the circuit. Um, entrainment mapping. Um, if you ask me like, how did I figure uh, out what was going on with your typical intra-atrial re-entry tachycardia patient before we had electroanatomic mapping, it was entirely about entrainment mapping. 
Um, basically what you do is you use a roving, you put the patient into tachycardia, you use a roving catheter to pace into tachycardia, usually 10 or 20 milliseconds um, uh, shorter than the tachycardia cycle length. And you basically use that as a probe to ter determine whether any particular site is in or out of the circuit. The logic being that if you actually capture the circuit um, from a location that's in the circuit, when you come off pacing, it will basically take the entire tachycardia cycle length and no more to get back to that location. Um, so the way you would do this, number one, it's not really useful unless you have a macro reentry tachycardia. So the first step is to establish that that's the diagnosis. Um, and then you go through and you define areas that are in versus out of the circuit. And that allows you in your electroanatomic mapping not to waste time on areas that are actually out of the circuit. And this slide basically shows an example of that. It's a patient with intra atrial reentry. You can see the atrial tachycardia cycle length down here on this halo catheter. Uh, tachycardia cycle length is 189 milliseconds. We pace into that faster, and then when we come off at this particular location, the post pacing interval or the return cycle length is very, very close to the tachycardia cycle length, which tells us that we're either in or very close to the circuit. Um, substrate mapping is another form of mapping that can be used. Um, early in the uh, experience with entrainment mapping uh, for postoperative atrial flutter, it was recognized that that technique worked really, really well for fairly simple surgery like, you know, post-op Sennings or post-op ASDs or VSDs who had, who had, you know, simple flutter. But for Fontan patients, um, it didn't work very well at all because as soon as you tried to pace in to the tachycardia, it would change to another, another cycle length, another tachycardia circuit. Um, and so um, increasingly people started to use um, substrate mapping. What that means basically is in sinus rhythm or in a standard paced rhythm to go through and map the entire chamber, specifically looking for areas of scar. Um, and in this um, uh, classic paper written by Apache Zeppenfeld um, in Tetralogy of Fallot Patients, um, using pace mapping, uh, I'm sorry, using substrate mapping, um, looking at voltage, and then combining that with um, uh, area, by, with, with defining SCAR as areas um, with low voltage, but also with failure to capture the unipolar pacing at a high output. They were able to identify areas of SCAR that actually were uh, the drivers for uh, tetralogy of flow, ventricular tachycardia. Uh, so substrate mapping has been used for Fontans, uh, has been used for tetralogy patients, um, and various other uh, types of, of approaches. The idea basically is that you define the areas of SCAR, and then once you know that, you would look for gaps between scars, and that would be your ablation target. Um, increasingly, a big topic uh, in our world is the potential of voltage mapping and AV node reentry. A number of laboratories do this routinely. The idea is to um, map the entire atrium looking for areas of low voltages in the so called bridges, which are uh, meant to um, define um, the actual slow, slow pathway. And generally, a successful ablation in that location is, is associated with uh, loss of voltage. Um, and here's an example of what that basically sort of looks like um, with these sort of low voltage bridges that might constitute a target. Um, so, you know, theoretically, um, voltage mapping can identify the basic anatomic substrate for AV node reentry. Um, you know, a standard AV node um, often has both an anterior and a posterior AV node extension. Um, and, uh, and so it's the posterior AV node extension which we believe corresponds with the slow pathway. But there's a fair amount of variability, and in fact there are some patients whose posterior AV nodal extension is actually on the left side of the septum. Um, so to me this concept makes biologic sense, but um, in order to prove this actually helps you um, is a bit of a challenge. And why is that a challenge? It's a challenge because even without voltage mapping, almost all laboratories achieve at least a 98% success rate without using this technique. So you'd have to sort of show me that this adds value in some way, either in terms of shortening your procedure time or, and this would be like the, um, the holy grail for me, is if you were able to show me a patient with a left-sided posterior AV node extension that basically had no bridges on the right side but had them on the left side, that would, that would probably convince me. Um, I don't actually use this technique. Um, I don't find that I really need it.
Um, other mapping topics, um, bump mapping. Um, I think many of us have been in the situation where we've been in the process of mapping a tachycardia and suddenly things disappear. Either, either pre-excitation disappears or um, a hind pathway disappears or a tachycardia terminates and can't be reinitiated, whatever the, whatever the, the, the thing is. Just catheter pressure is enough to transiently interrupt um, a substrate. Um, so this is a great application of electroanatomic mapping systems because if you actually can recognize that you've just bumped a pathway or a focus, you can mark that and uh, know that you're at that spot and that allows you then to do basically more of an empiric ablation. Um, a second type is ice mapping and this this term really kind of is borrowed from the early days of intraoperative ablation, where we would go to the operating room to ablate an atrial tachycardia or a ventricular tachycardia focus, um, and the surgeon would, would have a, a cryo probe in their hand, and we would basically look for a place where the, um, uh, the focus disappeared during freezing. Uh, these days with cryoablation, um, we can do the same thing. Um, if we actually observe, for instance, in this slide, um, loss of pre-excitation with the application of cryoablation. Um, that indicates that that's where the pathway uh, is or was. Good rule of thumb uh, is that if you can see an effect within eight seconds of getting to your minimum temperature, um, that predicts um, that, that you're at the right spot and that, um, that there will be a low incidence of recurrence. Of course, you're going to do a four to six minute lesion and, and a freeze-thaw free cycle as well. Next, we consider so-called automaticity mapping. Basically, when you heat up uh, various types of uh, tissue, you can get acceleration or abnormal automaticity. We, we know that um, in the postoperative period, junctional tachycardia is a manifestation of injury to the conduction system. Um, heating, um, as we know with AVNRT ablation, will also cause automaticity. So you can use this uh, phenomenon for mapping. Um, it's typically, so this was first recognized uh, in uh, AV junction ablation when radio frequency uh, first became available as a sign that you were in fact at the right location to see, you know, rapid junctional acceleration and then sudden termination with resulting AV block. We use this for typically automatic focus tachycardias like atrial ectopic tachycardia, ventricular tachycardia. Um, and uh, what one sees when you're at the right spot is an acceleration followed by termination. Interestingly, this can also be used for things like left posterior fascicular VT and behind pathways, where application of the energy at the correct site will cause some automaticity. And this slide shows um, a patient with a Maheim pathway um, uh, who is fully pre-excited with atrial pacing, and as you can see with application of radio frequency energy, the Maheim pathway accelerates, um, looks almost like uh, VT, and that's a site that we are, a sign that we are basically at the right spot. We're going to shift gears now and talk about ablation technology. And again, this is a much larger topic than time allows, so we'll just try to hit the high points. We'll talk about classic RF, which is now known as dry tip ablation, irrigated tip RF ablation, catheter cryoablation, cryoballoons, pulse field, and radiotherapy. So classic radio frequency ablation has been available since about 1988. Um, prior to that, ablations were done primarily with DC shock ablation, and RF quickly replaced this primarily due to safety issues and the fact that you didn't actually need anesthesia to come and um, assist um, in the ablation. Um, RF ablation is uh, essentially destroys tissue by combination of resistive heating, which is basically like a toaster oven, um, and convective heating, which is um, the spread of uh, temperature um, from the spot where the ablation is, is done. Um, uh, typically, we use temperature limited um, variable power, so we set a target temperature depending on which laboratory you're, you're in. It can be 50 to 65 degrees Celsius, um, and power is variable to achieve that particular temperature. Um, most systems available these days just uh, max out at 50 watts of power, and it's important to um, avoid overshoot um, above 100 degrees Celsius where the tissue boils and you get a um, impedance rise. Um, a, a drop in impedance during a lesion uh, delivery indicates lesion formation. 
And um, this has always been helpful to us because uh, the change in temperature and the impedance drop during an RF ablation provides some guidance to us in terms of our catheter contact. In other words, if we're at full power with very little elevation and temperature and no change in impedance, it means we're not making good contact with the tissue. Irrigated tape ablation has been available since the mid 90s. Um, this avoids high temperatures around the tip tissue interface and therefore avoids um, you know, those sudden impedance rises and um, pops that actually can occur. Uh, it makes larger and deeper lesions um, without really disrupting the endothelium. And so that's actually uh, something that that's um, uh, an advantage. Um, but I th we think in general in pediatrics that there's probably a higher risk in smaller hearts just because the lesion is larger and deeper. Um, it's ideal for things like atrial flutter where you need to make a transmural lesion um, but probably not necessary for just things like endocardial pathways and, and things like that. Um, it may also be useful in uh, areas of low flow, but you need to use it with caution because um, uh, if it's, in a, for instance, in a vein or something like that, um, you can make a very large lesion and that can be a problem. Um, one situation where it might be useful is if you have a patient who needs an ablation and they are on ECMO at the time um, because Normal blood th flow through the heart is what normally cools the tip of the catheter um, in classic ablation. On ECMO, you may not have very much flow across the tip of the catheter and you may need to use um, irrigated tip ablation. Um, there's also a loss of the cleared feedback um, that you get with temp temperature. You don't really want to see the temperature rise. You want to see it actually fall a bit. Um, uh, and nowadays we have um, uh, for sensing catheters that actually give us some um, input in terms of uh, how much catheter contact we're making that, that obviates that, that problem. Um, cryoablation has been around since 1998. Um, currently, there are three catheter sizes. Um, there, are two French, there are two seven French catheters with four millimeter and six millimeter tips. And then there's a nine French size with an eight millimeter tip. Um, in practice, I think most of us these days are using the six millimeter tip, resorting to four millimeter for the smallest children. Um, typically, we do a four minute lesion minimum. Um, some people will, will go out to eight minutes. And often what we'll do is we will do what's called a freeze thaw freeze, which means that we go on for four minutes, come off for just about 10 or 15 seconds for you know, for temperature to go back to body temperature and then come, come, come on again immediately. Um, that probably increases the um, success rate and decreases the recurrence rate. Um, the disadvantages of cryoablation as compared with RF are, in general, we see lower success rates and we certainly see higher recurrence rates. The procedures are a little longer because rather than a 30 second lesion, you're doing a four minute lesion with a second lesion at that spot. And uh, also important to remember that the catheter is, is significantly stiffer than your standard RF catheter. And so if you're going after AV node reentry, just recognize that if when this catheter goes to the septum, it's very, very common to see some PR interval prolongation and occasionally even heart block just with catheter contact. So once you put that cryoblation catheter up, um, make sure that you are knowledgeable about where the tip is and avoiding uh, you know, compact AV node. Uh, what are the advantages? Well, it's really quite a bit safer. There are basically no reports of permanent AV block as a combination of cryoablation. And it's also useful in low flow states such as the, the coronary sinus or the middle cardiac vein if, if it's indicated to do an ablation there. Um, and just the other news is that it is now very recently been cleared by the FDA for application in pediatrics down to age two. Other modalities that might find their way eventually into pediatric and um, congenital heart disease ablations. Um, first of all, uh, cryo-balloon ablation. This is a very common way of doing pulmonary vein isolation for atrial fibrillation in the adult world. Um, and we recognize that there's an increasing incidence of AF in adult congenital heart disease patients, and there increasingly are reports of pulmonary vein isolation uh, in those patients. And so, of course, cryo-balloon will be useful for that. Uh, theoretically, it might be useful for a ectopic atrial tachycardia arising from the mouth of the pulmonary vein um, as well. Um, pulse field ablation is the new form of, uh, of energy delivery um, currently um, being trialed in uh, adults with, with atrial fibrillation. Um, pulse field ablation theoretically um, is specific to cardiac tissue. So the hope with pulse field ablation 
is uh, a lower or even a zero incidence of injury to non-cardiac structures such as the esophagus or the phrenic nerve, which are basically problems that are seen with AF ablations in the adult world. And then finally, stereotactic radiotherapy. Um, this is basically using radiotherapy, which normally we think about as being useful in uh, treating cancer, um, either with photons or with protons. Um, and uh, there are a number of centers that are using this technology to do uh, ventricular tachycardia ablation. Um, notably, when you couple this with uh, modalities such as electrocardiographic imaging, otherwise known as ECGI, it makes the entire procedure potentially completely non-invasive. Um, in practice, these have been used primarily for patients with intractable ischemic ventricular tachycardia. Typically, these are patients who already have a ICD in place and have failed medications and have been getting therapies from their ICD. Um, and initial uh, results have been published that suggest that this may be a uh, valuable modality for that group of patients. So I'll stop there and looking forward to discussion and questions. Thanks.